And with that, with that pressure, and even if you're not a part of a gaming crew, if you go to a tournament with friends, that pressure put on you can really affect your gameplay. Different than literally, I I know it was because of nerves. I played scared. I played too safe. And my first note is like, go into competitive gaming with confidence. You've played your friends. You know what to do. Well, you know what you're capable of at that time. Be open to learning. And if you lose, ask the person, hey, what do you think of my skill level? What do you think I could do better? Why did you do what you did? Always look to learn. And honestly, in a lot of competitive gaming scenes, yes, there are people who are kind of mean, but there are also plenty of some of the best people I've ever met. People who won't mind sitting down with you and some friendlies and saying, hey, this is how this works. This is how that works. And this is what you need to do. And that is the best learning experience you can have. Get good practice in and everything. And another psychological point to make is the fact that a lot of competitive gaming is... It's not like a physical sport, like football or anything. It's purely mental decision making, being able to make decisions on the spot really quick and make predictive decisions. Because a lot of games have input lag. Like I know Smash 4 has about six frames of input lag. So most of the things you do are more so predictive than reactive. So being able to foresee different events happening and being able to react that quickly requires a sharp mind. And honestly, the reaction time is somewhat genetic. So if you feel like you're reacting slow in competitive, it's a side note. If you feel like you're reacting slow in a game, some things you can do. Sometimes you can improve your reaction speed, but other times it's just genetic, and your reaction speed is just genetically hindered. But back on what I was saying, basically, like I said, confidence, being knowing what you can do, and being open to new things is big in competitive gaming. You can't go in thinking I automatically know everything. Like I said, not a single tournament I've gone to and I didn't learn something new. Last tournament I went to, I went two and one. No way, I went one and two. And it was it was a very disheartening experience. It was very, very downing because I felt like I had gotten so much better. And honestly, just because you lose a tournament does not mean you haven't gotten better or you haven't improved. It just means that there's just more for you to learn. And that's awesome. Like, how boring would it be if you just beat people all the time easily? Like, people, friends that I am with who like to watch anime and stuff say I have a very Goku mentality where I like to <laughs> <He> play... <does. laughs> I like a challenge. I don't like when things are super easy. I hate it when things are easy. Why would I even play if it's easy? If you're losing, that means you have more to learn. Meaning, guess what? You have more time to play this game that you enjoy playing. Meaning, you get to get better and eventually bop people. And that is satisfying. Can you introduce yourself again? We're now recording. Okay, okay. I'll start with you. <laughs> I'm Anthony Obando. I am the uh, current Melee champion title holder. For the time being, here in a Mill South chapter, I play Super Smash Bros. Melee, Rainbow Six Siege, and Street Fighter V competitively. It, that's in no particular order. Hello, I'm Cody Sperry. I am a member of the competitive gaming group here in Columbus, Georgia called Crew Round 2, or CR2 for short. Uh, I compete with Super Smash Bros. 4. I would like to play more Super Smash Bros. Project M, but there's not a lot of tournaments for that locally. And then I do compete uh, with Overwatch, and I stream regularly regularly on my uh, Twitch account, uh, CR2 Decoder. My name is Aubrey Wilson, and I am a competitive Smash 4 player. I am also a member of CR2, and I have been for about two years now. See, um, Smash 4 is the only game I play competitively, but I admire and study all competitive games and aspects. My name is Marvin Crumbs. I am a competitive fighting game player, specifically Injustice 2. Uh, I also used to play uh, Call of Duty competitively, and I stream weekly uh, every Saturday on my Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv forward slash best TF tonight. Well, now that we've gotten Aubrey's Little, part that he wanted to yeah. talk about out of the way, we're going to open the floor up to questions because this is supposed to be one big. Q&A panel. Q &A, with so, Mountain Dew and Doritos. Uh, Y'all can ask about any kind of competitive gaming. Y'all can just ask more about the mental aspect, what it's like to be part of a competitive crew, because when I used to think of competitive gaming, I honestly just thought of a person at home playing a game constantly and then fighting other people. I never understood what it was like to have a full group around you. And having a group that actually can take you to these bigger tournaments, these bigger events helps your growth a lot more because I honestly would not have gotten a lot better at Smash 4 or any other game that I play competitively without the crew because how many people know about Nerdicon here? Okay, how many people know about Bad Manners? 
<laughs> see smaller people. Bad Manners, it doesn't go on anymore right now because of some issues, but it was a local tournament that happened out in Opelika, and I never would have known about it if I didn't have a crew. So to anybody who's interesting or interested in getting into competitive gaming, one, look around in the area. Atlanta, when they have the big conventions, there are usually a lot of tournaments for games and then just look around one here in columbus too just see if any other smaller towns are having tournaments for any game i know uh, i think out in warner robbins is where they do typo house weekly for smash 4 am i right on that nate and there, there are just plenty of places where you can get started with competitive gaming and sometimes it's starting a casual tournament within your friend's basement that really gets it going for people true story <laughs> Also, uh, here in Middle South area, we started uh, an annual Smash tournament called GGDA Middle South Smash Up, which is going to be, which is a uh, all five Smash Bros. games. We do acknowledge Project M, despite that it's not that popular as it used to be, and it's all five, and it's an all day event. So uh, keep up with uh, our social media on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll get you more updates on that. Yes. So when you compete, you and please repeat the question to the mm -hmm. mic. When you compete, do you see a difference between college level competitions and the competitions you do? And it's pretty much the same. The question is, yeah. do you see a difference between college level competition and other competitions? Uh, when it comes to competitive gaming, there's no, like. There's the no, like, the school level competition. competition. It's a tournament. The we, well, in short, the competition well, yeah. is the competition. Yeah. That's, I am the uh, former League of Legends uh, collegiate organizer for two years here at CSU before I graduated. Uh, so the competitive scene in gaming has been showing up recently in Columbus. Uh, we like to definitely like to see more. Recently, it has been uh, going down since a lot of changes have been going on with people. Original members have been graduating or leaving out of Columbus. So a lot of things have been going out, but. Uh, Anything competitive gaming, we've recently seen people from Crew Round 2, which I'm also a member of, uh, have been doing a lot of competitive game, mostly in the Super Smash Brothers kind of field. Uh, and I would say in my question, but in my question though, <laughs> since those kind of I mean in particular are a lot more specialized, don't you think uh, like organizations like Crew Round 2 would focus more on those who have really great interest in other categories such as games like League of Legends or Hearthstone or probably more into Overwatch. Um so the I'm still considered one of the greener members of the crew. Uh we have definitely started to expand our horizons a little more. Back when we first joined, uh the crew was exclusively was almost pretty much exclusively uh, Super Smash Bros. Melee with some people that played what we call real fighting games. But um, as of late, we've started to expand more. There's actually a very good portion of the crew that does competitive Overwatch. And I just recently moved over to PC, but we're all split up between different consoles. There are people that play on Xbox, PC, PS4. And with there being so many games that we can all play, it's hard to find ones that each one of us want to kind of specialize in to where most of us are playing multiple games at once, which kind of hurts, but at the same time makes it a little more interesting. Yeah. You guys got anything to add on that? Comments or Ms. Brasky over there? So would you guys be interested in hosting or, or participating in a test of tournaments? Actually having a real, with, with, with actual spectacle, eSport events where you have multiple gaming tournaments going on at the same time? Oh, the um, question is, will we be interested in a large-scale game tournament uh, for instance like evo that's happening this weekend um we've yes. gone we've gone to tournaments <laughs> yes. Like yes there is a big um local that's uh, a monthly called gwinnett brawl that's in duluth georgia we try to go to it as much as possible that's basically where as smash for tekken um Pokin tournament injustice a whole bunch of different tournaments there as far as hosting one if we could find a decent venue for a decent price um we actually, been actually working on that with uh CR2 AJ and bring you back attention pulse for 2017 here at CSU. So yeah, like I'm pretty sure they'll keep people updated as it progresses and gets more relevant. So if you guys come to the booth out there, we're talking about when you see the rising culture. Mm -hmm. um, these are the sunglasses are from the Sports Council of Columbus, Georgia. We actually have several venues. 
Um, we actually, um, one of the, the gals, Sherry Deary Sherman, went to the largest esports council meeting up in New York, and everybody was there from the EA, Blizzard, you, you name it, everybody was there. Columbus, Georgia was the only city represented at that council. She came back with her eyes, big as saucer. She's like, oh my gosh, this esports thing is kind of a big deal. So I bring that up because we're also doing a very large scale robotics tournament uh, coming up. And with Fort Benning's 100th anniversary, uh, we have a couple of opportunities in the next year and a half to actually do some really big things. And would love to, to coordinate with you guys on making that happen. Oh, what well, you discussed with because I'm kind of the one in charge of all the gaming stuff here in Middle South chapter. So cool. just I'll get you my contact information later. Okay, okay so. We, we've been talking a lot about like behind the scenes stuff with competitive gaming, you know, getting to these venues, finding venues, talking about a lot hosting, but do y'all have any questions about any of the games that any of us play? Because a lot of us range on what we play. I mean, we have someone who plays competitive fighting games. We do Smash. I do a little bit of Overwatch. I play Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah. So, you had a question? Um, barrier, barrier to, barriers to entry for people and for players for tournaments, I guess, because I know the for the esports scene, for League of Legends, teams have to pay like millions of dollars to get their team entered into these uh, pro tournaments. What about uh, Smash, like Smash Melee? What are the barriers to entry? The, for, 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 it's um, the higher risk, higher reward. The, but to to get into those tournaments, there's not there's not really it, uh, barriers. It's, like, the, it's not so the, the, the barrier to everybody. You're going to be at the top somehow. The biggest the biggest issue, like honestly, like the most I've paid for a tournament has been like twelve dollars. And, and they pay out still pretty well because of like two, close to 200 people show up and they give the first place winner like 60% of the pot. You're still going to, if you make first place, you're still going to be making a huge profit if everyone pays in because you usually like a door fee combined with a game, an actual specific game fee. As much as I can think that would be expensive for Smash particularly is the traveling. Like we have a couple of crew members out at Evo and of course traveling out to Las Vegas, playing for the, paying for the plane tickets and the hotels is really the only expensive part and well... Stuff in Vegas is probably more expensive as yeah. well, but that's really the only expensive part. As far as the games themselves, you don't have to be of any skill level or have to know anybody to really be allowed to go to a tournament. You just have to know about it, have the means of getting there, and have the whatever amount of money they want for you to enter, and you play. To add on to that, I was saying higher risk, higher reward. So bigger tournaments, bigger name tournaments like Evo are going to have bigger payouts, but you're going to have more people to play against. While smaller tournaments, well, in compared to Evo, when Brawl is, I'd say, smaller. Pretty small. Oh, yeah. A lot compared, <laughs> that's a lower risk. That's technically a lower risk tournament in this kind of situation, example I'm using. So you'll get a lower payout compared to risking thousands of dollars going to Las Vegas and playing at Evo. Then going maybe about an hour or two away from here and competing for that for one day. When you, when you go to the do you stay overnight or you just go overnight? It's one day thing. One day. We there drive are, up we drive up in the morning, come back at night. There I are multiple day tournaments like um he went to Momocon, which is a multiple day tournament, and also he plans on going to DreamHack, which is also a multiple day tournament. And yeah. yep. like it helps having a crew though, because they help with um expenses, information. Um we all carpool. And it's it's uh, it's a, if you want to get into competitive game, getting getting a gaming crew like you can do a solo. If you can do a solo, do it. But getting a part of a gaming crew is beautiful. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. So uh, just one thing that I know we touched on earlier that we kind of didn't go in depth to was once you start picking up a game for competitive purposes, you kind of look at it a different way. And one example is how many people have played Overwatch or at least familiar with what it is. Okay, yeah, Overwatch is really popular. At its core, it's a really basic first-person shooter. And when I played it with my friends, you know, it was fun and everything. It basically felt like a better version of Call of Duty. I never really liked Call of Duty that much. I, I know that it's got fans, but um, when I started doing the competitive mode, it actually was because the crew was like, hey, we need one more person to fill in this slot, and we need someone to play healer. Still kind of mad at them for making me do that. But, you know, I was like, hey, I, I'm, I'm down for, you know, doing another competitive game. And I've always liked, you know, first-person shooters. I grew up playing Call of Duty and stuff, so why don't I try this? And the minute you go into a competitive mode for a game, especially one as simple but complex as Overwatch, where you're with a team and you actually have to work with different groups of people, you start to enter this world that has this thing called meta. And for anybody that doesn't know what meta is, it's essentially 
a way of thinking within a game that's deemed as the way uh, a lot of the times that's the way you play it who you use and how you go about achieving the objective within the game and that is real and meta very much defines how people play the game which characters are deemed viable which characters are deemed unviable which ones are bad good or just pointless to use no matter what you do and the biggest thing with games like overwatch is that because it's only a year old and it still has a big competitive scene patches as patches come out for the game and they fix things it changes how the meta works. It changes how you have to play the game. For anybody that did play Overwatch or has done competitive, everyone knows about Roadhog. How Roadhog used to be a powerhouse within that game and could basically drag you through the map if he hit you with his hook. Well, when they nerfed that and made it to where it was more realistic and wasn't broken, basically, Roadhog became less and less valuable and other characters started to stand out more. And that happens with any game. Whenever a certain character gets nerfed, even if other characters don't get something improved on them, they will start to rise up in popularity or play rate. And when you're doing a competitive game, there are a lot of people who like to have what they call a main, which is a character that they'll play. It's really popular in fighting games. They have one character that they play all the time. They play that character no matter how bad the fight might be. So it could be a really bad idea for a long-range fighter to try to fight a close-range fighter, but they're going to stick with that person because it's who they're best with. But in a game like Overwatch, where meta shifts and characters are deemed not useful within that current meta, it becomes very hard for people to stick with a game like that. Because the way they're looking at it is, I'm not having fun anymore. I can't play the person that I want to play. And if I try to pick them, the people that I'm being forced to play with, because I might not have a full team, so I'm queuing up with random people, get angry at me, they start screaming at me, they start throwing games... And it becomes a very unfun atmosphere. I've experienced it both on console and PC, so it's not specific to one group. But it's just something within the community that you learn to deal with. And it makes it, it is a huge drawback to competitive gaming because nothing sucks more than you know trying to play a game for fun and having five other people screaming at you. Or in the case of fighting games, you pick a character and no matter what you do, you just get no progress with it. Um, to add to that, basically, like patches affect every competitive game, especially any any game in general. Patches, buffs, nerfs affect any game. Um, specifically to Smash, there was a character at the beginning of the game that was extremely good named Sheik. She was absolutely just busted, broken, best character in the game, no doubt about it. She is now probably like fourth, fifth best in the game. Not a big drop, but still, she used to be like unbeatable they nerfed her ability to kill they removed her confirms like she can never no, she can no longer reliably defeat the other opponent at all it's all very reaction and prediction based it's much harder and more difficult so therefore there were several people who dropped the best smash player in the world used to play her but she got nerfed so hard he dropped her he said not playing her anymore dropped her for another character who didn't get nerfed as hard um, other characters like Luigi, Greninja in Smash 4, they were considered top tier, and now they're bottom to mid, mid tier in the game. Basically, like, I think like 20, 30 play, 30th place. Um, is Roy still really considered a low tier? We're not going to talk about Roy. <laughs> no, uh, not with Nate in the room. Not with um, uh, we're, yeah, we're not going to okay, talk about <laughs> It's okay. But, it's top tier in your heart. Basically, the point is, like, patches affect what he said, like, the meta. They affect what people prefer to use. And a lot of things that I used to think about, like, why are there such so many, like, Sheiks? Why are there so many Marios? Why are there so many of this character, that character? And I thought about it. If a character is higher on the tier list, considered better, more people will play them. Statistically speaking, if there are, like, there's 80 people in a tournament, and 70 of them play top tiers, and only 10 of them play bottom tiers, statistically speaking, it's more likely for a top tier to win the tournament. So that's why top tiers get the most results. It's not because they're necessarily better. They are. But it's not even because they're better. It's just because there's more of them. Granted, those are the matchups that are like, those are characters that are easier to learn against. Like, oh, everyone plays them, so I'll learn more about that character than any other character. But they're still really, really good. While bottom tier characters, whenever they win a tournament or do well in a tournament, it's considered to be huge because no one knows anything about that character. And for someone to take that character further, like, you could think a character's complete trash. Like Olimar. Olimar is considered a complete trash in Smash Bros, but a player from Japan named Shutan made everybody completely change their ideas. The best player of Smash Bros, Smash Bros in the world, said, you know what, Olimar might be high tier. 
granted, he calls every character high tier. So, <laughs> but um, it's like Pikachu. Oh, uh, that's nasty. But like, it's just. It's like a best of, like it kind of draws to the psychological part. It's all about people's view. Like it's not like meta in fighting games isn't like meta in Overwatch. Meta in Overwatch is like die hard. This is what's supposed to be done. There's nothing else you can do. You need to switch characters right now. Go for it. In Smash Four, it's like you know what? There's a way around every single matchup in the game. You can. There's a way to beat every single character. And just, in Overwatch, you just gotta change characters. It's it's much more nine times out of ten you have yeah. to change characters unless you're like me. Yeah, he's, he's very <laughs> he's he's a mercy man at heart. Um, no. Oh god! <laughs> but um, I'm a mercy man at heart. What are you talking to, about? Going so going play. <laughs> going deeper into that when we talk about things like meta, it's definitely gonna shift when you go from games that are usually played independently. When you play a fighting game, you're usually playing by yourself, training by yourself, working on your skills. But when you go to team-based games like League of Legends, um, I don't know if Heroes of the Storm is considered competitive. I don't know what that's like. Overwatch, any game that puts you with a team and you have to play with them, it's going to become a very more structured, strict, and sometimes harder environment to progress in because you're only as strong as your weakest link. So you usually have to get a team together and practice with each other and figure out, hey, these team compositions work if we dive on this objective at this point with these characters and do this set play, then we'll be able to win. But it's hard to do that sometimes because a lot of people don't like the way the matchmaking works for competitive or in Overwatch, it is very possible to get steamrolled to where you don't ever touch the objective and you do nothing but die the entire game. Kind of like how in fighting games, you don't get a single touch on your opponent. And so it's because there are very set ways that the different heroes in games like Overwatch and League of Legends interact, it's a lot harder to be able to structure around it sometimes. And a lot of people don't like that very fixed play style. I hate it sometimes when I play because I like playing a certain set of heroes, but when I'm in a time where those heroes just aren't considered good anymore, it's, it's kind of hard to play the game. And even when I'm with a group of people, we struggle more because we play heroes that are just weaker to the very popular heroes at the time. Like in Rainbow Six, if you want to attack the objective properly, there is the still the set set of characters that you have to have. And even then, if you say you don't want to pick one character, they're going to yell at you and say, hey, why aren't you picking this character? We need this character for that. And if you want to play the character you want to play, fine, you're just going to lose your team. And it's not going to be fun because communication is important. That's probably one of the biggest things in team-based competitive. Like in Overwatch, like in League, like in almost every single, everything out there, Just it's communication. Even in doubles in Smash Brothers, that takes communication. Even if it's with silent, looking at your partner and then questioning why they didn't do anything, it's still communication regardless. I think one of the... Um, uh examples of communication is uh, during League One League Legends Worlds Finals, uh, there's a team called Royal Never Give Up, which is a long-running uh, league team. Their team at, at the World, Cham- World Finals Championship consisted of both Korean players and Chinese players, and they both speak their native languages, but they still communicated well through understanding uh, what, the, what each objective was going to, because uh, certain games are allowed to have well, team-based games have a lot of communicative little things like pings or uh, messages or something like that. But usually, they can't really communicate verbally with each other. But different ways of communication uh, can be adapted to beyond language and video games, and that's like one of the most powerful things they got so far. Even though they don't have like a they, like a way of communicating like our like like our native language compared to their uh, separate differences like that, and uh, they didn't win the uh, uh, world championship, but they did make the finals, which is still a really big deal. Yeah, and uh, a major part of that is mainly chemistry with your teammates. Yeah, have teammates that you like, or like at least have teammates that you can work with. Because I know when I played um, Call of Duty competitively, I played with a couple of my friends. Yeah, one of my friends lives here. I have one friend who lived in Texas, and I have one friend who lived in Boston. So I mean, like we're playing together, but 
and but we were in different places, but we just got along so well that our chemistry was just there. And so that's the big thing to uh, competitive gaming with the team. If I can Overwatch, I can call it in all that. Pick people that you can mesh well with. Pick people that complement your style well, and that can bring that can either bring out what's good in you or help pick up what you're lacking, basically. And another thing in a lot of those team based games, even when you can't, even there are certain things that happen within team based games like League of Legends and Overwatch that happen but you don't really communicate because there's this thing in gaming that's referred to as game sense people also use it in sports for like soccer and football it's knowing what's going to happen because you've seen that scenario before and knowing how to react to it and that's another mental skill that you kind of don't train you just learn it as you go and that's one of the biggest struggles for team-based games is there are people that constantly try the same thing over and over and they just want it to work the way they want it to work. And they don't think, okay, so I'm getting dived by a tank. So instead of trying to fight a tank with my slow-moving, squishy offense hero, maybe I get you know the stronger offense hero who's known for busting tanks open for breakfast <laughs> and just going to town on them and preventing them from diving my supports. And it's knowing when to do things, how to do them, and doing it at the right time. Because... Another thing that is very popular for not being done well in the competitive matchmaking when you're not with teams is in Overwatch, each character has a set of abilities and then they have an ultimate ability. What a lot of people do is they don't know when to use those ultimates because different characters can actually completely counter or wipe out what your ultimate does. For example, there's a character in the game, Overwatch, Soldier 76, that has a ultimate that is literally an aimbot and he goes into the mode he auto watch the characters and as you're holding the trigger it'll the bullets will basically guide to whoever he's targeting but a tank in the game named diva has an ability that can eat all projectile based damage and so she can just sit in front of soldier 76 absorbing all of his ultimate no damage is being put out and what essentially that does is that wastes a skill a specific tactical advantage that you had during that fight and so you end up losing because you couldn't get the team off the point or you couldn't take the objective in time because you couldn't kill the right targets at the right time and so not only do you have to be able to communicate with your teammates but you also have to know yourself okay i have to do this at a specific time in order for this fight to be won in order for me to take an objective and that's not a skill a lot of people can really develop because I've seen people that are in the higher tiers that don't even have basic game sense sometimes. They just have the mechanical skill to get themselves there. Um, to add on to that, I want to... When he was talking, it made me think of something that we've... Me and fellow friends have talked about in competitive gaming. It's talent versus experience. Like, as he said, like me and him are both some of the greener members of our gaming crew. And there are people who have been playing the competitive games for like years. Like, I know members of our crew that have been playing for, like, almost 10 years. It's playing for a long, long time. And yet, like, we started out, we were scrubbed. We were really bad at the game. Now we're starting to catch up. We can take games off them. We can hold our own against them. And it's not because we're talented. No, it's because we're starting to rack up an experience. But there are also people who are just extremely talented at video games. Like, we have, I've had friends who just progressed faster than I did. Like, we picked up the game at the exact same time, but they just progressed faster than I did. And it was just... I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. And it took a long time before I could catch back up. And to continue on to that, there's this thing called plateauing. In any game, any skill, any activity that you do that requires you to progress skill-wise, you can plateau. Once you start forgetting what, like, you don't know what else to do to get better. You don't know what else to learn. You basically mastered, so to speak, in your mind, what your, your craft is, and you don't know what to do to get better. That's when people who are less experienced than you start catching up with you. And a way to keep from plateauing in games is to keep that fire to keep improving. Always be creative. Always be willing to try new things. Always push the meta. And then, like, like I said, even though I say Overwatch is a game where it's like, yeah, strictly meta, there's nothing wrong with trying to do your own thing. Because, of course, fun is supposed to be the point of games. Yes, it's competitive, but have fun. Have fun being competitive. Be confident, be happy, don't let losing discourage you. I've absolutely been comboed to death, bopped by the most beautiful combos I've ever seen before <laughs> in my life, and I shook that person's head, hand and thanked them for letting me experience it. Like, that, it was just beautiful. He actually has. Like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> thank the guy for bodying him. Because it it's, it's a learning experience. It's something that you can put in your mental notebook, like, all right, no, not let that happen again. 
And basically, like, whenever I get hit by a certain move or if I get killed, my, my thought process isn't, man, that's dumb. Man, I'm angry at this game. It's, I should have never gotten to that high of a percentage. I shouldn't have let him win that exchange. I should have done this instead of that. And having that type of mentality, I'm not saying my mentality is the best mentality to can, can, I can have because I get frustrated too with games and certain time games are just frustrating. But for a competitive gaming, there are three things you really need. Confidence, determination, and time. The confidence to know that, hey, I'm going to get good at this game, even if it takes me forever. It took me, I've been playing Smash 4 for two years, and I still haven't made it out of pools in a tournament. Like, it's probably going to be another few years before I, do, before I do and get that good. Determination. I am determined to make it out of pools in a tournament, no matter what it takes. I put in at least three hours of training a day for Smash 4 just so I can do, get better. And also time. I have to have that time. I manage time between school, work. Well, I'm out of school now. But work and anything else I have to do to dedicate my time to get better at that game. And I know a lot of people say, oh, gaming's not really worth it. I've won money from some tournaments. And that's free money sometimes. Because some tournaments are just free. It's just easy. And it's free. But um, it's a fun activity. And it's it keeps you from doing other things that could possibly be worse to do with your time. You There's nothing, like, there's nothing wrong. Like My mom doesn't have to worry about anything when I leave the house. Like, hey, where are you going? To go play some video games? Like, <laughs> like, like that's all I do, and it's it's fun. But like, like I said, confidence, determination, and time. That's all you really need to be good at competitive games. Competitive game and keep moving forward. Don't get discouraged if you lose. Don't. Okay, some games are jank. I'm not even gonna jank. But acknowledge the jank. Embrace the jank. Whatever is dumb about your character, the game you play, exploit it. Use it to your advantage. Like in um for honor, when you could literally do environmental kills, <sighs> use that job. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. so I, I okay, yeah, we we've got about 10, 15 minutes left. So I know we kind of talked for a long time. We said this was gonna be a Q and A, but you if y'all yeah, y'all have any questions about anything we talked about, it could be some of the terms we use, some of the stuff we've experienced, anything. Seriously, we have 15 minutes left. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Give us something to do. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was kind of wondering, in games like League of Legends, Smash, Overwatch to an extent, uh, there are a lot of different matchups. Uh, I was wondering how you kind of learn to deal with different matchups. Oh, oh let Aubrey take this. <laughs> let Aubrey take this. <clears throat> um, as I said, I've never made out of pools in a tournament, and back to like, Experience is basically matchups, learning what works against certain characters. And you can a lot of times you can only learn those matchups by playing them. I've recently gone online to like find out people who play certain characters and be like, hey, I wanna learn this matchup. I play Marth. And if I wanna learn a certain matchup, I say, Who who do you play? They tell me who they play, I'm like, hmm, not really interested in learning that matchup right now. I'll get, get back to you later. Someone plays a character I'm interested in learning about playing against, I play against them more and more and more and learn what works. Also Every game, if not most games, have some form of database in them of what how the game works, like what certain characters are weak against, frame data in the game, like how fast movies come out. Study that stuff. It's amazing. I used to study it in the middle of class sometimes. Like, it's it's just something I do. And he's not kidding. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> but like, so just basically to learn, <laughs> to learn to learn a matchup, you just like you play the character against the character as much as you can. Sometimes playing as the character can help. Um, I know for a lot of games, like Smash Bros. especially, there are plenty of videos online. In the age of technology, YouTube is your best friend. Go to YouTube, watch videos on a character, watch professionals use that character and see what happens. And honestly, sometimes you can't be stubborn. Like me, I play, I made Marth die, like, like literally dedicated, dedicated, only character I play for referral. But there's just certain, certain times in certain matchups you have to change characters. And sometimes learning a matchup doesn't mean you're going to win the matchup. Because in a perfect world, and in theory, if you and a certain person are equal in skill, but your play, your character loses to their character, they're going to go, come away with like more wins than you. And it's not as simple as, oh, get good. Or, oh, get better than they, than they are. Because as you're practicing, they're also practicing. As you're getting better, they're also getting better. So they're not just going to let you just run over them. So sometimes you have to play a different character that does well against the other character. I'm not saying drop your main or drop the character you play and just be a pushover about it, but know when to change and when to stand your ground. And that's the biggest thing about being able to perform well in all matches in a game. And that's something I'm even learning now, even though I'm still a diehard main because my character is top tier now. But yeah.
Yeah. So what are in the tournament? What are the conventions for who picks their character first? Do they pick at the same time, or do you let the other person pick? So it really is the same time it's most kinda, times. It's kinda, yeah. It's kinda, okay. So it's the, the question the question was how do you go about picking characters? Well, in like fighting games. Generally, in the rule, in like official rules that I've read for Smash Four, it says player one picks first, player two picks second. But nine times out of ten, y'all are just picking at the same time. And once you lock to that character, you can't switch just because you go, "Oh, they're picking a character I lose against. Let me swap off them." Because then you'd be there all day going back and forth. Yeah. And then after your first match, uh, the player who won will say whether or not they'll stay that character. And then you, whoever lost can s decide if they want to swap characters, and that I think that's the norm with most fighting games that have that sort of interaction. And then with games that have different stages that have different properties, you will then do a process called stage striking, where you choose which stage you'll fight on because certain characters benefit from certain stages. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a lot of general. It's general. What I call gentleman rules. Basically, it's like it's not written, but it's understood. If yeah. you do that, you. you you're kind of um, not trash, but you. I might think less of you if I pick Marth and then you automatically switch to like Sonic. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna. I'm probably gonna look at you a that's certain a way. Of, that's a bit of an extreme. No, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna look at you a certain way because it's like it's kind of respect thing, like a pride, honor. You know, do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Don't play Sonic. You know, I'm joking. I'm joking. But like, it's just like a gentleman thing. Stop. Um, any other Sorry. questions about anything that we ha that has to do or pertain to competitive gaming? Um, if you want to ask about certain experience, act, like anything, anything. Okay. The lady, lady in the lady back. Um, so, with most hobbies or passions, you start to see them spill over into other aspects of life. Um, so, for each of these, um, you start to see them I'm gonna let you start because. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this goes all the way back to when I was in high school. So, when I started playing against these guys, it was just some casual fun time and every break that I could get. And then I had to stop because my senior year came around. I started doing my graduation project or senior project, and I had to put aside. Most games. What am I kidding? I still play games. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not lying to anyone. I really still dedicate myself to playing a lot of games, and I regret that choice when I could have spent more time doing my project. I'm an insolent fool. Uh, but then college started, and I realized I need to put more time into school. But I've still found time every so often to catch a break and still play some games. Like I haven't had time to play. Melee, so I can go out there and defend my title in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and I haven't played that game really in, I think, two months? When was the last time you came over when we played? It's been about a month. It's been about a month or two since I last played. Hardcore. I went up there, and I said, how do I do this again? How do I get back to this rhythm? Because I also, I work four shifts a week, I'm taking summer classes, and I'm working with everything with GGDA. So, it really is trying to find the perfect balance. Uh, for me, the... Opening up into competitive gaming actually introduced me to a world of people that I never thought I'd actually get along with. It's when I first met these two, I didn't really talk to them. I had a class with him and a class with him. I never really interacted much until he showed up one day with a laptop with the Smash Bros. game on for the 64 on it. Let's and I said, hey, I bet I could beat you. Don't bring up the record, okay? No, not the record. I was actually going to just go straight to the story. Okay. I did something I should have not done, but I'm going to say it anyway. It was, I had four Xbox 360 controllers with my laptop, brought it out in class, said, hey, this is a good idea. He said he would beat me. And I then, ended up beating him, and that's how this all started. Yeah, so we started hanging out. So competitive, Sorry, Crumbs. Yeah, competitive gaming <laughs> basically introduced me to, one, a whole new world. I never, I honestly thought competitive gaming was a joke. It was always something me and my friends had joked about. I never thought it was an actual thing. I didn't know people actually made money for it, or... The, in my mind, it was you played the game casually or you were already like on a pro team playing League of Legends or something. I only thought League of Legends was professional gaming. And it started spilling into my social life. I started hanging out with a group of people that also played video games. I used to think I was the only person at Columbus that really played video games as much as I did. And then I started trying out other games. And then I was like, hey, I actually would love to make one of these games. 
you know, myself, I'd love to build my own game. And that became my senior project. And his dad was actually my mentor. And I learned how to build a game. And now it's something that I thoroughly enjoy and would love to do in the future as a potential career. So competitive gaming and just gaming at its core just started stemming off into these different passions and these different, you know, things that I love to do in my life. Now I started streaming because I love to share, you know, the funny moments and, you know, sometimes the raging moments during games. I like sharing that experience with other people. Um, for me, gaming just helps to reiterate some of my own, like, philosophies. I believe so heartily in Hakuna Matata. No worries. Don't really, like, care that much. Well, I care, but it's like, I'm not going to stress. I refuse to stress about stuff, like, at all. And basically, gaming, if you stress, you're going to make bad decisions. And it just gave me more reason to be more relaxed and chill. And hanging out with the people I hang out with, yes, we get turned up and lit sometimes, but it's still pretty chill. And it's it's changed me in ways as far as my dialect. Like, I say dog a lot because one of my friends, Brian, say dog. I'm like, what up, dog? I say it all the time now. I say that's lit. Didn't used to say that before. I say chill. Didn't used to say chill before. It's just hanging out with these different people have given me a new aspect. Because I used to be very antisocial, like a hermit. I used to stay in my room. I still stay in my room all the time. But when I smash, basically. <laughs> but like, I'll, anytime he hits me up and says, yo, Aubrey, you free? Ask my mom, yo, ma, am I free? You free? I'm free. And I'm gone. <laughs> it's just, it's giving me an outlet to get out of the house, do things I love to do, find a passion. Of course, I don't want to pursue a career in it, but it's... I do. <laughs> it's definitely... I mean, it's like my, one of my, it's my best hobby right, hobby right now. Video gaming, it's a good pastime. It keeps me from doing stuff like being bored constantly on a daily basis. Chess. Yeah, I really love chess. Chess is life. <laughs> but um, it just teaches me patience, understanding, because sometimes in a game, you just got to accept stuff how it is. Like if your character goes flying off the screen for some unknown reason. Oh, well. We take uh, those. Exactly. You just <laughs> have to fight it. Those. And in life, sometimes you just have to take things. And also, to end it off, on um, my note, like, there was an example. My mom works for Tisa's, and she explained to me how uh, sometimes credit card works, how you get extra money. Like, this one little girl was like, okay, I have a $50 credit card, so if I pay you $50, can I get the, can I pay 50, if I pay $50 in cash, can that $50 just be on my credit card? And my mom had to explain to the lady, no, it doesn't work at that. Basically, the $50 that she paid would get taken out of first, and then it would start hitting her credit card. And I understood that concept immediately because there's a character in Overwatch called Torborn who gives people armor. And basically, when you take damage, it hits the armor first before it hits your actual health. Exactly. So, so all of the analogies you could think of. Yes. <laughs> like, the analogies, they help me in life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's Marvin, 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 Marvin finish up this by oh. answering. So, um, how gaming has led into my... Has this, like, how has it affected your... Um, it, it's affected me in a big way, mainly because it's given me a lot of inspiration to pursue something that... There, okay, there's a good bit of ethnic diversity in gaming. But I feel like in some communities, it's a bit stifled, you know? Uh, I, I go to Twitch, I very rarely see any black streamers. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so that inspired me. I was like, hey, I don't see a lot of African American streaming and all that. So I was like, I want to be kind of like a full, not, not exactly a forerunner. I want to kind of be part of this new change ethnic diversity in Twitch and competitive gaming because you, you play games like uh, fighting the fighting game scene and uh, I don't say Gears of War you see a lot of uh, different ethnicities and stuff uh, you see African Hispanic uh, Korean uh, Japanese Chinese all that but um, I just wanted to see a lot more of that so it's giving me like a new drive to play games like it's it's lot, it's still about fun, but it's also about leading a change. So that's the main thing. Uh, that's how it's played into my personal life. Thank y'all for coming. Okay. If and you want more Mountain Dew and Dreamers, there's still plenty more to get. I got too many. Just uh, <laughs> one one last thing I kind of want to leave y'all with. When I was yeah. growing up, I was always told by other people that you're never gonna go anywhere with games. Or